We begin in Mali, where Malian authorities and armed ethnic Tory groups have begun talks in a bid to resolve conflict in the West African state. It is hoped that the meeting will allow nationwide elections scheduled for next month. Suzanne Wongeli with the details. The talks were initially expected to begin on Friday, but were postponed at the last minute by the Malian government. However, on Saturday, the two sides began talks which are being mediated by Burkina Faso President Blaise Compaore in Ouagadougou. This dialogue is important for two main reasons. First, the necessity of holding a presidential election on the fixed date of July 28, 2013. This election will mark the end of the transition period and will consecrate the setting up of a democratic and legitimate power which will be able to engage Mali in the search for peaceful and sustainable solutions. Compare said the two parties had to agree on the redeployment of general administration, basic social services, defense and security forces to the north of Mali and in particular Kidal. Tuareg rebels have until now refused to allow Malian soldiers and officials to enter Kidal. For decades, they have demanded greater political autonomy from the southern capital Bamako and more spending on development for the impoverished region, which they call Azawad. This meeting is without any doubt a great hope for people of Azawad in general. The displaced and refugees in particular who are trying to live with dignity on their homeland. We are encouraging the international community to get involved with the mediator for peaceful and quick solution to this crisis and end the suffering of people from Mali and Azawad. The mediated talks follow the first fighting in months between Mali's army and the National Movement for the Liberation of Azawad, or MNLA, rebels. Government troops advanced towards the Tuareg last strongholds of Kidal in the northeast of the country. Both sides are expected to reach an interim agreement by Monday. Failure to which, the Mali government has said it will occupy Kidal by force. Kidal has been occupied since the end of January by MNLA rebels, who are accused of ethnic cleansing in the area. Mali's government has previously said it planned to recapture Kidal before the July 28th elections. Susan Mongeli, CCTV. Let's take a quick look at how the crisis in Mali began and what might mean for the country once the French troops who launched a military offensive against the Islamist rebels in the country earlier this year withdrew. Clementine Logan has more. Tensions in Mali reached breaking point in January last year, when armed ethnic Tuaregs rose up to fight for independence for the north, overwhelming government troops. Frustrated officers then launched a coup that toppled elected President Amadou Tamani Touré. Together with Al-Qaeda-linked militants, the Tuareg rebels seized key northern cities, but were then chased out by their former Islamist allies. France sent troops in January this year to block the rebel advance on the capital Bamako, pushing them into desert and mountain hideouts and allowing the Tuaregs to regain control of their traditional fiefdom, Kadal. France began withdrawing some of its 4,000 troops from the country in April, with plans to gradually hand over to the Malian army and a UN peacekeeping force. But a recent UN report says African troops forming the core of a UN peacekeeping mission to be deployed next month are not yet properly equipped. Added to this, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said on Saturday that despite gains made by French troops and the presence of security forces, the situation remains precarious. With elections just around the corner, Mali's government and Tuareg separatists began talks on Saturday aimed at calming renewed tensions in the north and enforcing a ceasefire to pave the way for a permanent peace deal. Clementine Logan, CCTV. And still in Mali, and things are not all rosy at home. Armed groups in the country continue to pose a security threat to the entire region. This is according to a new UN report which says African troops forming the core of a UN peacekeeping mission are not yet properly equipped. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said in a report to the Security Council that despite the gains made by French troops, Malian security forces and an African force of Visma, the situation remains precarious. Now, once the UN peacekeeping 
peacekeeping force, which will now be called MINUSMA, is deployed, France will continue to handle counter-terrorism and peace enforcement operations. And the mission will handle traditional peacekeeping duties of policing and trying to ensure new violence does not erupt. Most members of the Arab and Torek communities in the Timbuktu region of northern Mali have not returned. They fear retaliation by the Malian security forces and the local population. That is growing concern in South Africa tonight as the nation waits with bated breath for the latest news on the condition of the country's iconic former leader Nelson Mandela. The South African presidency announced that Madiba was seriously ill with a recurring lung infection on Saturday morning but has remained silent for more than 24 hours. Renee Delcam has this report. South Africans of all races, classes, cultures and religions held prayer services across the country on Sunday to pay tribute to Madiba, who millions regard as one of the greatest sons of South African soil. Father, we come to you right now for Madiba, who's in hospital. But we want to thank you for his life. We want to thank you that he brought our country freedom and kept it from the brink of disaster. Lord, I pray that as a mentor that many in our nation would look up to him. Lord, he is the father of our nation. And we ask you to put your hand upon him. And as South Africans and people around the world prayed for former President Nelson Mandela, concern mounted as journalists from every corner of the globe waited outside the Heart Hospital in Pretoria for the latest update on his health status. Friends, family and a few African National Congress comrades visited the ailing elderly statesman in hospital and others said they would always remember Nelson Mandela's great courage and contribution to his country and the world. Nelson Mandela, despite the recurrence of uh, the lung infection, pneumonia and so on, He's, he has emerged as a fighter, and he's always been a fighter, I think. Uh, uh, that's what makes Nelson Mandela. And um, we believe that uh, he will pull through, you know. But to us, as the ANC and the country, he still remains a father figure, uh, the source of inspiration, the symbol of unity, and, and the statesman. Well, I remember him as somebody who gave uh, his all. Uh, somebody who embodies what you call the never say die spirit. I also remember him as somebody who loved his people very much and also remember him as a, a revolutionary. And prayers for Madiba are likely to continue for some time yet. Renee Delcom, CCTV, Pretoria. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take our first break coming up. Sudan may review decision to hold South Sudan oil flow, says Minister. And Libya Army Chief of Staff resigns after bloody clashes. Breaking news. Global trends. CCTV News brings you stories with the different aspects of Africa in the international content. With our reporters across Africa and all over the world, we'll tell you about the real Africa and how it impacts the world. Africa Live, every day, only on CCTV News. We follow the latest trends in global politics, economics, culture and sport and how Africa fits into the global picture. You decide what's important. We need some trade and justice. Africa's future will be determined by Africa. For women's equal opportunity for a better life. We have to change something and it's not the, the, the outsider. Talk Africa, a new voice for the world. Welcome back. 
Sudan may reverse its decision to close cross-border oil flows from South Sudan if its neighbor stops its alleged support for rebels. Sudan's information minister says although his country planned to close the oil pipelines within 60 days, Sudan could consider reversing the decision if the South stops supporting rebels. The minister's comments come barely a day after Sudan's president, Omar Hassan al-Bashir, ordered the immediate stoppage of South's oil exports. Bashir accuses South Sudan of backing rebels on his territory. South South Sudan, on the other hand, has threatened to stop all production if comments by Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir ordering a halt to shipments are confirmed. The recent hostilities comes only three months after both countries ended a bitter dispute over crude. <laughs> I have asked Oil Minister Awad al jaz to block the pipeline carrying South Sudan's crude all the way to Red Sea coastal city or Port Sudan. After that, let them take it via Kenya or Djibouti or wherever they want to take it. Libya's Army Chief of Staff Youssef al Mangush has resigned. His resignation comes amid clashes between protesters and the militia in the eastern city of Benghazi. At least 31 people have been killed in the clashes, with dozens more wounded. The protesters were demanding the militias give up their weapons and submit to the full authority of Libya's security forces. Karoyola reports. <laughs> Kills and lawlessness. These were the scenes at Libya's eastern city of Benghazi when clashes erupted during protests outside a militia headquarters. The protesters were demanding the disbanding of militias who have yet to lay down their weapons nearly two years after Gaddafi's ouster. Resentment against the militias has been growing in recent months. Last month, militiamen laid siege to ministries in Tripoli to force their will on the National Assembly. The Libya Shield Brigade is made up of former rebel fighters who say they are aligned with the Defense Ministry. Members of the Libya Shield Brigade were not immediately reachable for comment. Libya's new rulers are still struggling to impose their authority on a myriad of armed groups who often take the law into their own hands. Security remains elusive in the country with weapons from the 2011 civil war still awash in many areas. Carol Oyola, CCTV. Uh, for more on this, we're joined by Dr. Gamal Abdel Gawad, a professor of Middle Eastern politics. Professor Gamal, thank you for joining us. It's almost two years since the fall of Muammar Gaddafi and the rise of the armed militia in the country. How difficult is it for the Libyan government to deal with these groups? It is very difficult. Uh, the number of militias and the number of people who are recruited and those militias actually have uh, 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 increased uh, uh, almost five or uh, six times uh, the number of those people and militia uh, at the time of the ouster of Gaddafi. Uh, those militias have uh, uh, multiple purposes. Some of them are ideology based, others are regions based or tribes based. And recently we have seen uh, political actors, political parties and groups using militias to achieve political goals. Uh, 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 an example of that was the, uh, was the recent uh, siege of the parliament of Libya uh, to force it to legislate in a certain direction. So it is very complex situation and it's very unlikely uh, or, or it's not easy for the government of Libya to really end this problem. Dr. Gamal, will the government succeed in disarming the armed groups? Well, I'm, I'm not really optimist in that regard. I, uh, I think this, uh, this, this situation in Libya is likely to continue for some time to come. Uh, a, a few days ago, we have seen a, a regional leader in the eastern part of, uh, of Tripoli declaring this part of the country, uh, declaring this part of the eastern Libya, declaring this part of the country as uh, uh, semi-independent or autonomous within a federal Libya and uh, so we have we, we see a kind of a political and social fragmentation in the country and definitely this is a situation that is uh, very conducive for such armed groups to uh, uh, to prosper to continue and to continue challenging the state of Libya so dr. Gamal what option then does the Libyan military have in that country 
Well, the, uh, the, 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 Libyan, uh, the Libyan military, uh, uh, unfortunately, was uh, small in size, even during uh, Gaddafi time. The, uh, the largest part of the uh, Libyan military, military forces was uh, designed uh, along a kind of uh, uh, semi-autonomous uh, military units. But the formal military uh, was very small, and we have seen it disintegrated during the conflict. Uh, part of it have joined uh, uh, the rebels. Uh, and now the, the lines are blurred, actually, between the military on the one hand and the militia groups on the other hand. For instance, uh, this militia group that is uh, accused of killing the 31 people in Benghazi uh, yesterday is affiliated with the Ministry of Defense, actually. Uh, and this is a, some, 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 some sort of a tactic that the military leadership is trying to use to compensate for the weakness of the army and the military there. So even the state, even the army there is trying to use or to co-opt those militias without denying them their autonomous status. Again, it is very complex and difficult situation. All right, Dr. Gamal, uh, thank you for joining us uh, live from Cairo. Dr. Gamal Gawad, a professor of Middle Eastern politics. Now, the Congolese M23 group has applauded the United Nations for its role in seeking a peaceful solution to the crisis in Congo. Head of the M23 delegation, Rene Abandi, told journalists in Kampala that the UN Secretary General's call for both the DR Congo government and M23 to return to the discussion table was a sign that the crisis in Congo cannot be solved using military means. CCTV is Isabel Nakiria with that story from Kampala. Again. The M23 group said their decision to return to Kampala for the peace talks follows recommendations from UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the UN Special Envoy to the Great Lakes region, Mary Robinson. The Secretary General of UN came to visit us and it was a great visit which really gave hope to Congolese people because he gave a new uh, vision to the conflict, saying that Kampala is very important. On a recent visit to Kampala, Mr. Ban asked the M23 to abandon rebellion, saying their concerns could only be addressed using political means. The M23 said they are happy the international community now recognizes their concerns and is ready to tackle them through discussions rather than military means. The rebel group has in the past accused the UN of intentionally deploying a special brigade to attack them. Abandi says they now accept the intention of the brigade is not to attack them. We were just saying, if the brigade attack, we will defend ourselves. But now, the question is no longer there. The brigade is not coming to attack people who are talking. And we, in M23, we believe in peace. And we think the root causes of the conflict must be dealt. Recent clashes between the M23 and Congolese army resumed after the Kampala talks were suspended. The rebel group accuses the Kinshasa government of starting the violence. The return of the M23 delegation to the negotiation table is being looked at by the group as a final seal for a peaceful solution for the Congo conflict. Isabel Nakiria, CCTV, Kampala. The static summit, which is due to take place in Maputo, Mozambique on Sunday, has been postponed. Sources in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs said the conference has been postponed due to the unforeseen circumstances, adding that member states are consulting on a suitable date to hold this summit. The extraordinary summit was mooted at a setup meeting held on the sidelines of the African Union Golden Jubilee in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, two weeks ago. The summit is aimed at coordinating funding for Zimbabwe's elections, which the High Court ruled should be held by the 31st of July. What needs to happen now is we need to continue working with the people of Zimbabwe, supporting a Zimbabwean or made in Zimbabwe process that gives a roadmap towards free, fair, credible elections in Zimbabwe. Now, the date for such a meeting of an extraordinary uh, summit always gets decided upon by the availability and, and you know, programs of the heads of states uh, creating space for this extraordinary meeting. It's not an ordinary, it's not an, uh, you know, a scheduled meeting. 
After nearly 20 years in which the Millennium Development Goals have defined the international development agenda, the international community is starting to think about their successors. The deadline day for the broad set of targets set by the UN back in 1990 is in just over a year. Many have been achieved ahead of time, but huge challenges remain. CCTV's Guy Henderson reports from Johannesburg. Sometime when he gets a little bit of money, Zaki Samuel is one of a billion. It wasn't a good life for us. Walking along the streets he grew up on, he shares fond memories. I grew up here with everybody. I had friends. But as one of three siblings to a single mother who earned less than $1.25 per day, sometime my mother couldn't afford to pay rent. His family were extremely poor. It used to be a gravel road that time, and we didn't have lights. Times have changed here, but more for Zaki than for many of his former neighbors. He now lives in a wealthier part of the same township and runs a successful music business. He believes he's pulled himself above the cracks. I have never doubted my abilities. While I was still very young, Everything which I, you know, I, th I was thinking that I could do it and then I will do it and it became successful. We struggled, but uh, we survived. In the last two decades, Zaki has been a tiny piece in a global puzzle, beginning to fit together faster than experts had expected. Now, according to the United Nations, there are just shy of a billion fewer people categorized as extremely poor than there were 20 years ago. Now the international community is beginning to set its sights on a successor to the Millennium Development Goals beyond 2015. And one of the key things it could be aiming at is to eradicate extreme poverty altogether. But most of the success on reducing that headline poverty figure has been driven by Asia and particularly China. Africa says the UN's latest progress report has fallen short. And while its most southern country may be the richest, it's also very visibly one of the least equal. The fundamentals of a renewed development agenda may be universal, though the emphasis here may differ. We'll have to tackle uh, various issues. In South Africa, for instance, it's issues of distribution of, of, of income. We have enough resources in the country to be able to ensure that development reaches all the, the people. But rather, it's the way we distribute that income that really matters. Though policies are in place. Well, now we have a very um, extensive welfare system. Uh, we provide close to 15 million, 1.5 million social grants. So we have tried to come up with the measures to cater for people who cannot fend for themselves. Uh, so this is a huge uh, drain on the fiscus, obviously. That may have helped set the stage for this otherwise self-made man, but for the remaining billion below the line, it's still an uphill struggle. Guy Henderson, CCTV, Alexandra Township, Johannesburg.